Hey everybody, I'm Patrick. Uh, I'm a co-founder together with Amber Balde of a company called Clover, which I'm not here to talk about because she told me I can talk about whatever I want, uh, so I am. And I want to tell you guys three stories from fairly recent history, but it's not about blockchain, it's about infosec and uh, crypto engineering. And uh, I want to try to communicate that a lot of people have tried to do very similar things and uh, uh, there's maybe a lesson to be learned from that. So uh, yeah, that's me. Uh, everything you hear in this talk, I, I mean in the nicest possible way except in relation to one thing and that will be very obvious what that is. Uh, it's just my opinions, everyone I mention is awesome. Okay, story number one, password hashing. How many people have heard of an algorithm called Argon2? One, one person, which is funny because that's exactly the same number as l earlier today when I asked this question. Who are, how many people have used Argon2? Okay, okay, so one, one person there, so two on one. Okay, fair enough. Um, so Argon2 is the winner of something called the Password Hashing Competition, which was organized by some familiar names, including Zuko, Tony Arcieri, and it was basically like selecting SHA-3, but for algorithms that are suitable and for low entropy inputs like passphrases uh, for wallets or passwords for a password authentication algorithm. Um, so this algorithm is really, really good. It's like S-Script uh, or Script, which is the foundation of Litecoin, um, but on steroids. It's really good. It's much better than something called Bcrypt. How many people have heard of Bcrypt? <laughs> okay, the entire room. Uh, well, half the room. How many people have used Bcrypt? Okay, so like 10% of the room. This was published in 1999 by a guy called David Macieras, who now went on to create the Stellar Consensus Protocol, and uh, Niels Provos, who I'm not sure is in uh, doing anything in blockchain. Uh, they said, hey, this Blowfish thing is really expensive. When we run it, it's, uh, it, 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 it has kind of a performance requirement. Maybe we can use that in a good way instead of a bad way. Uh, and you may have read some of these articles. They were really popular at the time. They suggested just use Bcrypt. Uh, don't try to do anything else. You're going to mess it up. Just use Bcrypt, use Bcrypt. Um, well, Argon2 is the better algorithm. So why did nobody raise their hands when I asked uh, who's used it? Well, let's take a look. This is the specification for Argon on the left and the specification for Bcrypt on the right. And uh, you notice I copy-pasted at the bottom uh, a quote from the Argon, Argon paper that says it has two types of inputs, primary inputs and secondary inputs. The primary inputs being the password and the salt. Uh, but what is not clear from the specification itself, so what ended up happening is that every library that implements Argon2 does it in the following way. On the left side, I have to create a salt by myself, insert that salt into a function call that also takes all the parameters that were specified in the paper, which I have no idea what they are. And then I have to take the output of this, which is just some random bytes, save them somewhere with the exact same parameters that I used, and then run that same con concoction again later to do anything useful. Uh, take Compare with Bcrypt on the right, I get a password, a passphrase, whatever, I run it into Bcrypt, I get out a string that contains all the settings and the information that's needed, and even if I upgrade my Bcrypt settings, I'm going to be able to authenticate a user in the future. This is the kind of reason why people don't use good stuff. Argon2 is better, but it's impossible for somebody to write a blog post that says use Argon2, use Argon2, use Argon2. Argon2 is better, but only Bcrypt can actually move between things, be used in different languages, different libraries, and it's the only thing that's really even moderately useful for the most common use case, which is password authentication. Key derivation, on the other hand, Argon is great, but nobody actually does that, ex that doesn't know what they're doing. Um, so my point is, it's possible to be 100 times better and have absolutely nobody care, and that's not exactly uh, for, for no reason at all. You have to also have a pleasant experience on top of that. Uh, so just uh, at the risk of becoming uh, like Dave Chom and constantly telling everybody I made Bitcoin in the 80s, uh, I want to just point out that in 2013 on one of the th first threats on the password hashing competition, I said that the, one of the most important things we need to do is have 
an equivalent API to bcrypt and developers just want to run a function on it and not think more about it. And if we make it any more complicated, people aren't going to use it. Uh, so I've been making these complaints for a long time and uh, I'm here to do it to you now. Uh, do the stupid and boring stuff. Don't just do the, the research. Do the research, absolutely, but if you don't spend time, if you notice, you know, this, this API on the left versus this API on the right, the distance between those two is maybe two hours of work, maybe at most a day of work. Um, and that's what ends up deciding the fate of your, your project. That's story number one. Story number two, PGP is better. How to, how to see if something is uh, signed legitimately by a trusted key in PGP. You check the first line. I'm not even gonna, t I'm not gonna talk too much about, we all know PGP sucks. Um, PGP is better, just, you know, just host a key signing company, swap s parties, swap keys with everybody you know. Uh, what's the problem? Uh, well, okay, these are silly, uh, silly propositions, but the CA system sucks is not a new uh, dilemma, and removing the middlemen is not a new concept either. So do any, does anyone remember this? Okay, a few people. So in 2011, I went to Black Hat InfoSec conference, and I had my mind completely blown by Moxie Marlinspike, who is the author of Signal. Uh, before he made Signal, he made something called Convergence, which is a project that's built on research from Carnegie Mellon. Uh, it says, instead of trusting 650 companies on the internet to unequivocally and uh, without scrutiny issue certificates for every other domain on the internet, so an Egyptian, random Egyptian uh, CA can issue Google.com certificates. Uh, let's have users be able to select validators that they trust that then attest to the legitimacy of uh, their kind of uh, browsing experience, it, thereby decentralizing the PKI system. And, and I was sitting there, I was thinking, oh wow, this is, I mean, this, is, this was a blockchain moment, uh, you know, years before uh, I got into the, the blockchain space. <coughs> well, a few months later, Adam Langley, who's basically head of uh, crypto for Google, makes a blog post saying uh, he ha he's had many requests implemented in Chrome. I don't think that convergence is something we would add because 99.99% of Chrome users would never change the default settings. Combined, and, and because they never change the default setting, they have to run the notaries which combined means that they actually would offer users worse privacy uh, because they would be phoning home every time they tried to go to an HTTPS site. So that was, that, that nobody ever benefited from convergence even though it's a remarkable idea. Um, so compare with Let's Encrypt. Uh, how many people are familiar with, with, with what Let's Encrypt is? Okay, so all the developers in the room pretty much. Um, their, their proposition is, let, instead of trying to fix a broken system, let's go inside the, the bowels of the broken system and twist it around a little bit. And uh, they said, hey, what if we could become a certificate authority and then make it a script? And uh, that's what they did. They made a script that you, you basically, uh, you query an API, you get back a certificate. If you can prove that you can listen on a port, you get back a certificate. Since they've, uh, since they've launched, We've gone from 37% of the internet being HTTPS to something like 77% in the West uh, in, in current times. It's not solely because of them. The browsers also did a lot of work. But uh, yeah, it, it's possible to have much bigger impacts with in, you know, by f working inside the broken system and making uh, modern improvements rather than trying to radically reburn you know, burn everything to the ground and build it from the ground up. So their value prop was, listen on port 80, we give you a cert. Uh, that allowed other, other people to do even cooler stuff. So Caddy is uh, HTTP, it's an Nginx uh, competitor, statically linked, it's just a binary, you copy it around. Uh, it gives you HTTPS automatically, no config, nothing. It just, when you spin it up, you have SSL. And somebody who's configured uh, servers, you know, that's, several hours of work every single time and, and then, you know, not a negligible amount of money depending on if, how many wild cards you need. Uh, so my point here is that you can go for substantial wins in the background away from the user. 
the users don't care about the things you care about. They don't care about decentralization. They don't care about privacy. They don't care about themselves, even in a conscious way, uh, to protect themselves. You have to make good choices and allow people to configure your stuff, but make, um, make, make the choices that enhance people pri people's privacy for them and then compete on the merits with, uh, with the solutions that don't. Uh, which brings me to the topic where you'll learn which, what I'm going to uh, not appreciate. Uh, Signal, another project by Moxie Marlin Spike, a uh, recurring theme. He's done a lot of cool stuff. Everybody here knows what Signal is, I assume. Uh, it's got uh, probably the best uh, protocol for doing key rotation in a communications protocol. Uh, it uses phone numbers, so if you want to talk to somebody, you have to know their phone number. It doesn't do large groups chat group chats because it's kind of a high overhead uh, cryptographic uh, construction and it doesn't do GIFs in the messages. It's got 5 million downloads on Android. Telegram. Powell Durov of v Contacte. Uh, total technical mess. Uh, invented its own crypto. It's total gibberish. Um, he doesn't use a phone number for authentication. He does have group chats that scale extremely well because there's no encryption. He has inline GIFs, and he has 100 million plus Android downloads. It is, Telegram is so, and, and Telegram, I just, I'm amazed uh, at its popularity. They permanently store all contacts, messages, and media together with the encryption keys that they use to encrypt it. Uh, and they do it because they want to prevent a third party from insecurely backing up your data and allows people to sync, uh, you know, uh, efficiently across devices. I mean, this is just complete nonsense. Uh, and if you think you're not a user, I'm not, I'm not gonna do a show of hands, but like there's a significant number of people in this room that have Telegram installed. And that's not, it's not terrible, but it's not really great. And, uh, you know, it's up to us to design things that uh, can compete with that stuff. So WhatsApp is one example of this. They work with Moxie Marlin Spike, who occurs on pretty much every slide in this uh, presentation. Um, they have inline GIFs, they have a billion downloads, and they use the, the ratcheting scheme from Signal. They have some worse metadata properties, but they're basically the let's encrypt of, of instant messengers. So Moxie didn't really reach that many people with Signal and Trevor, uh, but they've uh, substantially helped a large portion of the Earth's population uh, with, with a slightly ver worse version of that. Um, so my point here is that convenience trumps security, even for people who supposedly care about security, uh, you know, the lesson here is that if we don't practice what we preach, then we're developing things that we suppose others will use, but we're not even really living up to our own standards. Um, we got to fix that, otherwise people aren't going to use our stuff. Um, so in summary, I will say spend some work on polishing your research because that polishing work, even though it's really tedious and annoying, is what could decide the fate of your whole project. Be as simple as you possibly can without making your product worse. Uh, remove all options from the user unless they click a thing to see options. And uh, I'm glad we're all worrying about like nitpicking uh, different aspects of consensus algorithms and kind of challenging Barbara Liskov's wisdom and stuff, but like none of this shit matters if we can't even uh, come within a fifth of the user experience of the centralized versions of the software that we're trying to compete with. So yeah, care about the stupid stuff. Uh, and I want to just say thanks to, thanks to everybody I mentioned. Uh, like I said, they uh, have done really solid work. Except for Paul Dorov and Telegram. I'm not uh, thanking them. Sweet. Thank you, Patrick. Um, do you want to do some Q&A, Patrick? Like one or two questions? Sure. Thanks. Hello. OK, first one. Yeah, I just assumed I'd run out of time. Uh, what's, what's Clover? <laughs> um, uh, Clover is uh, trying to make it easier to build and use these applications. So 
the gist of everything I just said is what we're trying to uh, position ourselves in a way where we can help everyone here provide a much better user experience. User experience being both for developers using their protocols, uh, but also for, uh, you know, hopefully the kind of people who say like, uh, who, you know, say that nobody in the room understands what anybody is saying. Um, so I did a demo earlier today. I don't have time to do it again, but uh, we're, we're kind of in the spot of, uh, if you think about the DevOps hype, what that actually is, is just people being excited about the prospect of being able to do things without the tedium of all the annoying things they had to do before, like ops and like uh, thinking about what thing runs on a server or whatever. In that sense, we're very much positioning ourselves in a non-existent layer of DevOps for blockchain. So basically helping, helping uh, the people building these protocols to scale them without worrying about the, the plumbing. And uh, there's another uh, second part of that story, which is to provide developer tools that build on stuff like eWASM, Polkadot, uh, to provide a toolbox for people who do not have any exposure to blockchain. So our theory is that 0.1% of the global developers uh, care about blockchain at all. And the 99 remaining percent of uh, developers just won't approach the subject unless they can see that they have a problem and they can see that there's a library and they can see that that solves the problem somehow. And if we're just keeping on saying that, uh, oh, go ahead, throw out 25 years of experience and compete with somebody who just got out of JavaScript school, uh, that's not really gonna entice a lot of people who uh, have a lot of, um, I, I don't wanna call it baggage, but experience uh, that, um, you know, sometimes rhymes with a lot with what we're doing and sometimes it's something that should disappear. Any other, okay. So, uh, do you think that the off-sited trade-off between security and convenience uh, can be, I don't know, offloaded into technology or is there this just kind of fundamental tension there? And I guess I would ask the same question about decentralization, which there's a sort of decentralization thing is confusing and a pain in the ass kind of those often go together. Um, and I feel like a, a kind of undercurrent in your talk is like, no, th it, it's very important for things to be convenient. Mm -hmm. uh, and to what extent is that like a fundamental trade off versus can it be compressed and, and evaded? So I, I agree that uh, more usability comes out of trade off of less security usually. I don't agree that it's a linear relationship. So it's very easy to say, oh, I don't care about usability because I want to have strong security. And that's unfortunately how that argument is, is used subconsciously or whatever. Like people just accept that their shit sucks uh, while actually it could be 10 times better without compromising in any way on any of the security constructions uh, that they've set up. So I don't buy the proposition that it has to be worse for, for security or um, usability, but uh, yes, I agree that there's a fundamental tension there, and especially in decentralized systems where there's some kind of incentive mechanism, and right now obviously you have to pay to play, like that in itself is a huge barrier. Um, but I, I'm, call me naive, I don't think it's, uh, it's, a, it's a battle that can't be won, I just think it's something that's harder than, uh, than centralized systems and that's not, that's not a problem. I mean, that's not a, that's not a huge issue. We just have to be ambitious enough to, to try to solve it. I find it funny that uh, uh, we talk so much about nuclear war today. I feel like if, if internet and going to the moon are both products of uh, avoiding nuclear war, I wonder if the thing we have to do is try to make nuclear war more likely uh, or something. And maybe then we'll finally find a blockchain use case. <laughs> Don't tell anyone you said that. Uh, uh, thanks, thanks a lot for your talk. Uh, I think it's great to have these uh, historical perspective. You know, those who forget history are doomed to repeat it, and all that. Um, that being said, just to give some credit to convergence, uh, they are kind of solving a different problem than Let's Encrypt. So, like, convergence yep. is trying to solve the problem of, like you said, cert authorities issuing fake certificates and and users trusting bogus certificates and stuff like that, whereas Let's Encrypt is just trying to 
proliferate SSL, which is yeah, a no and I, uh, noble goal in itself. I, I wanted to uh, to include uh, something to to show that and and to show that let's encrypt, even though it's not doing the same thing. I mean, technically now it's just the 600 and uh, first company that can issue certificates, so that problem isn't solved. Uh, I wanted to say that Let's Encrypt has obliviated the uh, global CA industry, but that's actually not true. They're making more money than ever before, just just more evidence that nothing matters. Uh, but 70%, something like 70% of new certificates are issued by Let's Encrypt. So at least as a number of, uh, you know, just the standard and it, it keeps increasing for what people are using. Um, hopefully it, it one day will be so that there are only things like Let's Encrypt and then we can start cutting down on the CA system. But yes, fundamentally Convergence does something very different which is much more about identity and, and authentication than it, is, um, than it is what Let's Encrypt does. Yeah, they have a, a bunch of deals and discounts and, uh, you know, a lot of people doing free the first year and stuff like that. So, uh, yeah, induced a lot of uh, healthy market competition, if nothing else. Yeah, it was great. Thank you.